fostered each other a little more, I think the world would be a better place. It would be a nicer place to live. If we could focus on the similarities rather than the differences between us, it would be great. So, I've been asked to speak here because I'm different to you guys. I live in a van. And you guys live in a house. You guys live in a house. And I get reminded of this difference between van and house every single time I meet a new person. People ask, where do you live? And I reply, Bristol, actually. And I have a van, so I kind of move around. And people step back and say, oh, you live in a van? And there's a tone of excitement, of intrigue, uncertainty. And you ask me another question, and I get ready for all the questions that you're going to ask about how I live in my van. One of the main questions is why I chose to do it. And I never, ever answer it the same way twice. And that's because it's just a decision that reflects me and who I am. So I'm going to try and take you on a little journey so that you can understand me and my decisions. And I hope that it might make you, make you see your decisions and your life a little bit differently. To stand on this red spot and explain to you guys what makes me me is difficult. Think about it. If you got asked to stand here, what makes you you? What makes you make those decisions in your life? What's important to you in your life? It's a difficult task. And please think of it throughout. To understand why I'm the way I am, you definitely have to understand my family. I'm one of four, with three older brothers and, ama and an amazing mum. My mum spent a lot of time on the road, and not in a glamorous or sexy way. She might want me to credit her travels across Europe on a motorbike in a bikini before she had four children. But if you add up the mileage, the time spent on the road after having the children is definitely a lot more. She's devoted a huge amount of her life, taking us to strange places at strange times in the night, in cars that break down and overheat on motorways. One of the most common journeys we used to make was taking my brothers to roller hockey training, an hour-long drive, probably made at least twice a week. There was one weekend where we dropped them off at a service station, and someone else gave them a lift. Me and Mum had two days of freedom. I don't remember much of the weekend. I was only seven. But I do remember Mum waking me up at a strange hour in the night and bundling me up and putting me into the car next to a duvet and a couple of carrier bags of clothes. I think she said we were going to France. And I fell asleep as soon as the car started. I'm a very heavy and good sleeper. You get practice stuffed up next to old hockey kit that smells of sweat and between two big brothers. The next thing I know, we're in a ferry car park. The clangs and crunches of the lorries and that horrible, dirty, metallic smell that's disgusting but I love because you know you're about to go up on deck and breathe in the fresh air. And we do, we go up on deck and we say goodbye to England and watch the wake and then we go and warm up with a hot, hot chocolate downstairs. I think we went back into the car and then I think I fell asleep again. And then we wake up in another car park. This time, we're outside a French cafe. A quiet French cafe, which again, I don't remember too well, but I think the walls were yellow and there were lots of funny paintings um, pinned up on them. I ordered the pâté, even though I don't really like pâté, but when in France, I think you're supposed to order pâté. And I finished it up and we were on holiday, enjoying a meal in a French cafe. I helped mum fold down the seats in the back of the car that night and we curled up in the boot under the duvet. And I just remember being so excited and tired from seeing these new things. 
being in France, being on holiday. And I speak to mum about it now, and she says, the trip didn't really work out. We never got to the house that we were supposed to get to. We couldn't find it on the map. And actually, she had no idea of the ferry times. So although the trip could be seen as a bit of a failure, we didn't get to our destination, I remember the important things, the spontaneity, the just, just going when you've got the opportunity and not really caring if you know the ferry times or not. Just driving down to Dover and going. And these are things that mum has completely accidentally given to me, and I think things that have allowed me to live in my van. She's not all spontaneity and carefreeness, though. When I first called her and said, Mum, I'm going to live in a van, she said, no, don't, don't do that, don't do that. And I said, why not? I've got an older brother. My, my eldest brother lived in a van for two years as well. I said, Rupert did it. Why can't I do it? And she said, oh, but you're... And I said, don't you dare say I'm a girl. <laughs> Imagine if someone said that to you. You'd tell them to piss off, and you'd probably want to do it more. And we just laughed together and started talking about the plans of, of what it would be like. And now I have this. It wasn't always that cozy, though. It took a lot of work to get it there. Those wooden panels that you've seen on the side took four days of taking old pallets apart, two days of very lonely sanding in a garage, two days of clearing up all the dust from the sanding, a fair few days of Danish oil, and God knows how many screws or days to actually get it all up on the wall. This is the earliest picture I have, and unfortunately, it tells a bit of a rosy tale, because it took me three weeks to get it to that point. But I want to tell you about one particular day, one particular feat when I made my van, and that was the day of the angle grinder. So I decided, against all adult fire-safe advice, that I wanted a log burner in my van to keep me warm through the winter. You may have noticed, for the observant of you, that it's not there. And that's not because I've listened to the advice. It's because I've not yet had the time. So, log burner. I need a hearth for the log burner. I go out and I buy myself some second-hand quarry tiles, and they're all beautiful and rustic. And I clean them up, and I need to cut them to size. So I go out to B&Q, and I get my masonry cutting disc, get it on my angle grinder, safety goggles on, I'm in the porch, I'm ready to go. And mum warns me that her ex-husband has been in that porch before trying to cut quarry tiles, got very red, sweaty, swore a lot, and just ended up with cracked tiles at the end of the day. And I thought, ah, I'll do it anyway. We'll see how it goes. So the first one, make a few cuts, it's going all right, and it cracks. The one's bare has gone. So I take a moment. I go back to the books. I consult YouTube. And apparently, if you let the tiles get too hot, then they crack. So this time, I take my time. And I get through them. I get through the first, the second, the fourth. And then I grout them in. And I have this. <laughs> this is my hearth without the log burner. And I don't know whether you like it. I think it looks quite pretty. I'm very proud of the little square in the middle, actually. That was, that was pretty cool. But that hearth, to me, is an achievement. It's a story. Um, and it was just a fantastic day of accomplishment making that. But it's not all success stories. There are lots of awkward moments, difficult things that I get living in the van. One of the most difficult and cumbersome things is when it comes to charging my leisure battery. You can see it, bottom left. That leisure battery powers all my lights, and I can charge my phone with it. <coughs> I charge that battery in the university buildings. I have to take it to a main supply. That battery is also 25 kilograms. The first day I took it in, I'd bought myself a wheelie suitcase from the charity shop. I didn't realize it had one wheel that was broken. 
I was basically dragging a canvas sack through the leafy streets into Beacon House with 25 kilograms in it, trying to do it inconspicuously. <laughs> I get into the library and I, I like fumble around and drop a pen and, and then try and plug it in at the mains inconspicuously. And then... The charger's got a fan on it. <laughs> um, but no one noticed. Everyone got on. And I had my battery charged. But since, I take it in a box, and I tend to take it at times when the library is quiet. I've had lots of funny moments in the library. A particularly memorable one was having to go in to wash my face, which had full black and white face paint on it from a fancy dress party the night before. And these are the kind of moments where you think, oh, shit, I'm going to look weird, I'm going to look stupid. But then you do them, and it's actually incredibly liberating, because it just doesn't really matter what you look like. When you wash in the library toilet, people see you in strange situations. Some of you actually might have seen me washing my face before the talk. Um, and it, you realize it doesn't matter. These, these pretenses that we put up when we go to work, they don't matter. So, other humbling moments definitely include going to the toilet. It's normally the third question people ask. Where do you go to the toilet? It's pretty simple. 95% of the time, I go to the toilet in a toilet. There's toilets everywhere. There's probably about 20 in this building. They're in pubs, they're at friends' houses, and normally you can get to one in time. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm actually quite good at holding, holding my bladder. <laughs> trained. The other 10%, well, five of that, outside. Sometimes It's nice to be outside. You feel pretty human, pretty humbling. I've got the squat position down. The other 5%, sometimes when it's daylight, and it would scare people if you just decided to take a wee outside. This guy. <laughs> Who would have known that a peanut butter pot is the perfect size for a morning we. <laughs> so, that's one practicality over. Another practicality, where do you shower? I have a gym membership. I try and shower at the gym, but I don't like the gym, so maybe I shower a little bit less than I should. I do carry all of my shower stuff around with me all of the time. My toothpaste, my shampoo, my conditioner, my soap. And you realize when you're carrying toilet to use around with you all day, every day, that you need a lot less. I am not carrying moisturizer around with me, and makeup is incredibly cumbersome and difficult to keep all together. So I've cut down in that sense. But I'm not a stoic. I still love my clothes. And I have all of my favorite ones with me. Often, I end up coming out a little bit mismatched, because I don't have a mirror in the van. But normally, by the time you get to a mirror, you've spent maybe half a day doing other things, speaking to other people. And again, they didn't give a shit about what you look like, whether you can wear orange with orange with orange hair. It doesn't matter. So they're the material things that I've cut down on. But more importantly, the van has taught me to kind of stream life, streamline the decisions in my life, to live my life in a certain way where I only do the things that I really, really want to do, the things that show and express who I am. I want you to think about where you live. I've been speaking as if I live in a van. I don't live in a van. I go to sleep in a van. I store my things in a van. I get dressed in a van. And that's really about it. I live in Bristol, in this amazing city. And when I'm really living, I'm making connections with all of the amazing people that make up this city. When I'm going to my Cuban dance class, or when I'm working at the pub, or when I'm just seeing random, random people walking down the street and smiling at them. Are you really living when you're in your house, in your dressing gown, watching TV? Or are you living when you're outside of your house, 
doing the things that matter to you. So I park in the places where the important things in my life are. And I very rarely leave Bristol, even though I have the opportunity to. I've been on one little holiday, and it was fantastic. I loved the solitude. I loved the beach. But I came back. And having the option to go and come back, and having the option to stay, makes me realize why I stay here. It makes me realize the things that are actually important to me. My friends, my family, my university course, my work. I want you to think about why you stay. What is it that keeps you here? What are the things that are important to you? So, imagine you had to stand on the red dot and tell me about you. Do your decisions, your actions, the changes you make in your life really express who you are and where you come from? Or have you just kind of been corralled along in the stream of things and you don't really know how you got to where you are? And if you're scared of, of making a change, a big change, and people will ask really difficult questions to you, embrace them. Because answering the questions is the fun bit. Getting over the difficulties and the embarrassing moments is the bit that gives you the fantastic stories. It makes you lead a richer life. So I'm not saying make a big change and go and live in a van. But I am saying go out of this room and really question your life and why you live it in the way that you do. And I promise if you do that, you'll start living a much richer life.